Hi, I'm Deborah from the Property Frontline. Hi, I'm Ken from Avora Finance. And I'm John Gilmovich from Real Property Manager. And welcome again to the next edition of uh, Property Mythbusters, where we bust some myths around all the contradictions and misleading information um, in property buying and, and property investing space. And we're going to be debunking the myth around that price, uh, when you get negotiating price, is the only thing that you can negotiate when you're buying a property, renting one, or taking out a loan um, uh, to, to purchase. Let's take a look on the rental side of things and what landlords and tenants can negotiate or what tenants can negotiate with their, uh, with their landlords. So what else can we uh, negotiate as tenants with our landlords or, uh, or, or property managers? Well, the first one, of course, is the length of your lease. And pre-COVID, when the market was very tight, there was some inflexibility around sort of lease lengths. Property investors like long tenure, obviously to avoid rental vacancies and of course increase in, in reletting costs. So they used to be pretty fixed on, um, on, on, fi on long fixed term leases, but the market of late has given flexibility to negotiate much, uh, much less tenure. You know, six months, if you're uh, willing to sign up for uh, six months and that's what you want to do because to have some flexibility, you'll find that today's market that landlords are willing to do that in order to fill their, fill their property and avoid continued vacancy rates, which are uh, high at the moment. Okay, the second one is the moving in date. Now, there'll be pressure from the landlord to get you in there as soon as possible, especially if the property has been vacant for, for a while. So normally, the kind of the tolerance level is to get you into the property between one, one and two weeks. But of course, that might not work for you as a tenant. You need to move in a bit later um, and three to four weeks, sometimes up to five weeks, depending on the overall negotiation. Sometimes the landlords are willing and able right now to be flexible on the moving in date. And of course, that gives you a bit of ease in relation to having to pay double rent, especially if you're moving from, a, from another rental property and still paying rent on your current property and not having to pay rent on your new one. That's, that's a, definitely a point of negotiation right now. Another thing that comes up is the pool and garden maintenance, is, and this is particular mm. in rental homes. Now, traditionally, pool and garden maintenance has been embedded into leases as the tenant's responsibility. But now, because of a, of a different marketplace, there are some negotiations on, on that front, as well as flexibility. And I have seen and have negotiated leases whereby Instead of the tenants paying the cost of that, the landlords subsidise the cost or include it as part of the, the overall rental, rental figure. And, and that gives them some control over the actual you know, gardening process and, and the pool and maintenance cleaning where they're happy that it's done and it's done properly and it's done regularly and it's not neglected because it is a hugely ne neglected area. Of, of, of tenancies where things go wrong, very badly wrong. Cosmetical changes or what we call alterations or minor alterations of premises. So things like, can I repaint a different, a different color or can I give the property a, a fresh coat of paint or can I install some extra safety locks or picture hooks comes up as, as a point of negotiation from, from tenants. So again, the tenancy legislation is on the side of the tenants in this case. And the, and the legislation says that uh, alterations, minor alterations to the premises should not be reasonably refused by landlords. Landlords and their property managers are willing to negotiate those things. And, and my advice to any tenants is to negotiate that before you sign a lease and, and not after where um, that comes up as a surprise. Do it up front before you accept the tenancy. Rental increases, of course, is, a, is an interesting one. And some landlords, because given the current 
rental environment, both on commercial and, and residential fronts, that rental increases in residential are not, let's just say, not welcomed with arms wide open right now. It's not a market where rents are rising rapidly. And the same thing with, with commercial. For example, you know, commercial uh, shop fronts that, you know, the landlord has this kind of old world mentality that they're going to embed, you know, seven to 10% rent increases each year uh, on year. Well, that's just not going to work at the moment, given the low CPI environment. You know, CPI sits around 1.2, 1.3%. So how can you expect a, a, a commercial tenant running a business uh, to have year on year, you know, seven to ten percent increases. The same thing with 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 residential. Residential rents aren't rising at the moment um, that that rapidly. Well, not not in the inner city markets anyway. You don't have to uh, accept you know excessive rent increases uh, d- during this during this market. So there's flexibility around that right now, especially on the uh, uh, fit out fit out periods on on commercial properties, for example. You know, you've got uh, the bare bones of a, of, of a shop and you need to fit it out for the purposes of, let's say, a coffee shop. Well, you're going to need time, leading time into that and fit it, what we call fit out periods or rent, rent-free periods uh, are up for negotiation at the moment. So that kind of helps you with cash flow and that you're not paying rent, uh, the market rent, right from the get-go while you're actually establishing your... Um, your business. So there's definitely flexibility and negotiation around that. The very last one, of course, the great debate of pets, pets in rental, uh, in rental property. I know that for a fact that a lot of tenants get discriminated around the keeping of pets, whether it's inside uh, an established uh, freestanding house or of late um, strata. Strata property has generally, and owners' corporations have generally um, declined um, the keeping of certain certain pets and especially dogs, but those laws have now um, been relaxed, and especially a landmark case which happened last year has opened up the opportunity for tenants to now keep cats and dogs mainly um, inside of a strata strata property where the owners corporations can no longer have any what they call harsh and unconscionable bylaws that blankly say that you cannot keep one. Um, so those laws are now relaxed as a result of a, a very landmark case last year inside of a strata building. So there's, there's a whole um, heap of uh, items you can negotiate on and uh, get yourself a win-win if the price is not part of the negotiation. Okay, great. I'll have a chat about home loans then in terms of what are some things to look out for when negotiating. So firstly, not all lenders when they, you know, when you're looking for a home loan will be open to negotiation on the interest rates because that's usually the primary cost that everyone's focused on. But there are also other costs um, to consider and sometimes even opportunity costs um, to decide whether to kind of, you know, choose one lender over another uh, so the, the first thing then would be when I, when I speak, uh, meet, meet, meet clients, usually the first thing would be we're looking for a home loan, uh, a lender who will likely approve the loan um, or who will not reject the loan sh- straight out. Um, so that's probably the first thing um, to be looking for, because uh, if you are looking for something that's you know, the, the, the absolute um, cheapest in the marketplace, you may find that you know you can't get the money that you you actually need, or you need a substantial deposit. Um, so there may be conditions that you don't necessarily meet to get that particular interest rate. So once we've got the list of lenders approved, it's quite easy to kind of then identify which lender is going to be the most competitive from the panel of lenders that I've got, um, thirty over uh, lenders. So some of the things that uh, you can kind of look at is the types of options that they have within the loan. So some lenders have a medico policy or a, a, a policy which targets particular professions like accountants and solicitors okay. uh, specifically, where you can actually borrow, you know, 90%, 85%, however the amount is, 
and not pay lenders mortgage insurance, you know, and that, and that could be a savings of a substantial amount. And that needs to be factored in, I guess, or weighted against, you know, what's the cost of the interest rate by this lender plus not paying lenders mortgage insurance versus going to another lender, paying lenders mortgage insurance and um, having a lower interest rate. I'll, I'll throw in there just real quick. If you are looking at interest rates, you'll probably find that when lenders are advertising interest rates, they also have a comparison rate. So the comparison rate just kind of includes costs, um, application fees, ongoing fees, like annual package fees and things like that into the product. So you can kind of see, you can, you can gauge whether there's a lot of fees included in that particular home loan. I won't go into the calculations in terms of how that, uh, how that works out. But it is a very good yardstick to kind of, you know, check to see if uh, one product is more competitive than another. The other thing would be the, uh, whether the loan product gives you the options that you're looking for. Um, so when going back to the approval first, um, you know, point, if you are buying a house and land package, not all lenders do construction loans. So it might be an idea to what well, you would, you would need to kind of identify a home loan that does offer that feature. Um, otherwise you might find that you kind of come unstuck um, when you're trying to proceed with the um, purchase and um, the construction is going through and you're finding out that the lender doesn't actually cater for house and land packages or construction. The other thing would be, and more recently, this is kind of going to opportunity costs, whether you pay lenders mortgage insurance or not. Sometimes, you know, I speak to a lot of first home buyers who um, are averse to not paying the lender's mortgage insurance costs. And it could be a substantial amount. Could be, you know, for $600,000 property, you know, could be on par with stamp duty, about 20,000. But it, it does depend on whether you want to kind of put out that amount of savings or deposit to bring your loan to value ratio down so you don't have to pay lenders mortgage insurance. I'm finding that a lot of first home buyers tend to prefer to keep some cash in reserve. Maybe they might not pay the full, you know, lenders mortgage insurance. They kind of pay a little bit. So they increase their LVR and pay a little bit of LMI. Um, so that's something to consider as well, um, because that could be then savings to purchase a new investment property or other investments. So there's a, a opportunity costs there as well. And the last thing would be borrowing capacity and timeframes. So, you know, with the speed of the mark, the, the, the speed at which the market property market's moving at the moment, um, which I'm, I'm assuming Deb's probably going to touch on a little bit. Uh, the one, making sure that you've got enough borrowing capacity to hit a price bracket that you're interested in. Once again, a lot of first home buyers seem not to want to stretch their borrowing capacities, which is prudent. Uh, when they go out there to find property, they, they kind of realize if they had an extra 20, 30,000 in terms of the loan amount, it pushes them up into a different price bracket. And that's, you know, it, it kind of ticks more of the boxes uh, of the properties that they're looking for. So borrowing capacity is, is one thing, and it may mean that the interest rate is not as competitive. So there's a bit of a, you know, pro con analysis to see whether, you know, you do want to pay a little bit extra on your home loan uh, to get a higher borrowing capacity. And the other one is time frame, so speed. At the moment, yeah, most, uh, most of the majors are running a bit slow in terms of turnaround times. And I'm starting to see now the smaller lenders are uh, also struggling a little bit. They're nowhere near as bad as majors, uh, but with, they're starting to see an influx in applications and things like that. So timeframes is also probably something, not necessarily that you can negotiate, but something that you can factor into choosing a home loan because that can play a part in whether you're able to you know, attend an auction or you know, bid on the property before it gets off the market. You know, th those are the kind of opportunity costs because if you're waiting, you know, six weeks, eight weeks to get your loan approved, where's the property market going to be at in that time? I'm not saying it will go up. Um, it could stay flat or decrease in that period of time. But, you know, ha have a think about what, what you think the cost would be to actually wait that long before re-entering the market. Uh, it could not, it may not even cost you anything to do so. But um, just a thought, food for thought. So that's everything um, in the home loan space in terms of, you know, not necessarily zeroing in on the interest rates. Deb, what's your take on on this with purchasing property. Thanks, Ken. That was great. Um, so I've taken a, a dual approach to this topic. 
in relation to using price in negotiation, there's um, an aspect of how you make your offer more attractive. So in a hot market, you want to offer other things other than price to be able to you know, have your bid accepted. And the other side is to make sure that you're protecting yourself and uh, making sure that you're getting the most out of the purchase. So how to make your offer more attractive? You could waive the cooling period or basically make an unconditional offer. Um, so in New South Wales, we call this a 66W uh, offer in that it means that you won't have the opportunity to, um, you know, do a deep cut if you want to wait for your finance. So if finance is improved, approved already and you've already checked out a building and pest inspection that might have been on offer or a strata report, then you might want to just jump in and offer, uh, offer to buy that way, buy really quickly. So you can negotiate on a longer or shorter settlement. Now, this is where... When you're looking at your property, it's important to gather information about what's important to the vendor. I'll say a standard contract, you might be looking at, say, a 42-day settlement period before you actually, before the property becomes yours. It might be that the vendor, the you know, person who's selling the property, might want longer. And so it's, it's around about asking these sorts of questions of the agent to find out what would be attractive and, you know, adjust according to what the vendor wants. The other point that we actually negotiate on is making the funds, so your deposit funds, available during the settlement period to the vendor. So if we know that a vendor is looking to sell their property and buy something else, they would want access to the deposit funds um, so that they can actually use that to put down their own deposit on the, the next purchase. And so, you know, we'll pick up that kind of information along the way while we're assessing a property and then when we're making an offer, we might include that. But, of course, it does come at a risk and you should talk to your solicitor about whether this is a, a good or bad thing because, you know, it could mean, though it's never happened to me, um, it could mean that the vendor might take off with the money and you might have trouble like accessing that if you crash the deal before settlement. The other thing that we um, try and negotiate on is unique items. So I actually once had a family that wanted the dishwasher from an old house. Um, it was an older dishwasher. I, like it was just sentimental value, but it was about paying attention to what that particular vendor needed and saying to them, well, you know, we're happy for you to take that. Like, we didn't want it. Um, and, you know, other items such as, uh, custom curtains or um, just but pretty much anything, just really what's important to the vendor and offering them the opportunity to take that with them if, once the sale has settled. The other thing in a hot market, you might want to do things like offering to cover their removalist fees and just thinking a little bit differently to provide extra little incentives. And yeah, then finally, it can really be anything. So it's really about collecting information about the vendor to make the offer really attractive. Now, this next point is a little bit controversial, um, but really, you know, property um, is an exchange between humans. And one of those um, participants is the agent. And we've got a scale of much more professional agents these days, but there's still an element of self-interest there. And so you do have to understand that the agent does play a part. If you're dealing with the agent putting in your offer, then they have to present a number of offers to the vendor. They're going to be a little bit biased as to 
you know, presenting those offers. Uh, they shouldn't be. A professional one wouldn't be. But anyway, uh, so you just have to understand that the agent is part of that offer process. Um, so one of the things you could do uh, if you're um, buying and also want to sell, uh, you could consider using the same agent uh, for the sale of your property. So, you know, I won't go into the detail about that. It's sort of a little bit controversial. Um, but the next point is very important. Really, you know, you're dealing in a professional and fast-moving environment, so you want to make sure that you treat the agents with respect, be honest and transparent. You don't have to play games with them. Uh, you can rest assured they've seen it all before, and so uh, you know, the more upfront you are with them, the more they will go the extra mile to help make the deal happen for you. Uh, ensure you're organised and respond to the agent's requests and reasonable requests. And make sure that you are organised, have your finance approved before you're ready to make an offer and make sure that you've reviewed the contract, blah, 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 and make sure you explain that to the, to the agent and say, you know, this is what we've done, I'm pre-approved, I've got nothing in my way to, uh, to buying this property. Now, on the other side, to make your purchase more successful, so thinking about your own interests, things that you can negotiate on apart from price are the cooling time frame. In most parts of Australia, we'd be looking at anywhere between 5 to maybe 14 days of a typical cooling period. So you negotiate the price and um, would sign the front page of the contract or a particular page of the contract, depending on the state. And then you have a period normally to ensure that you've got your financing uh, organised and approved and give the uh, bank time to value the property because even though you've got pre-approval, the bank still has to be satisfied that you haven't overpaid, so they want to value it. Also during cooling, if you haven't been provided with a building and pest report and strata report, that's when you commission those reports and inspections and review the results and just conduct further due diligence, particularly uh, that's particular to the property. So it might be checking out some council zonings and uh, building approvals. So the other thing uh, would be percentage deposit. So Standard contracts mainly will ask for 10% deposit. It's really common practice to go for 5%, but, you know, you can chance your arm, like go as low as you possibly can. Um, and then also the settlement period. In a similar way um, to the vendor, you know, how I was saying, like they might like a shorter or a longer period, you as well may, uh, it may be important for you to have a longer settlement um, but think about these types of things. I was just about to say in a hot market, you can make it subject to valuation, um, but really in a hot market, you just have to be as flexible as possible. Um, but we do use this quite often. Um, we just make sure that um, you know, we've got a bit of flexibility in relation to the banks. If we're buying in areas where we think the bank might be uh, a little bit soft on, like they might not agree on the price that we've paid. So we might say we want the, uh, uh, sorry, the sale um, subject to approval uh, by the bank's valuation. One thing I might uh, um, mention as well, throw in there while you're on the topic of value, because uh, from a broker's perspective, like that, that valuation process is a little bit, we're always fingers crossed to kind of hope that it comes back <laughs> on, on target. Um, it's, it's beyond our control. Um, so they have a panel of lenders who do the valuation and then they come back. One thing I was wanting to mention there is that uh, to kind of make evaluation a non-issue is not to borrow near key uh, LVR thresholds. So if you're like at 80% because you don't want to pay lenders mortgage insurance, if the valuation comes back short a little bit, you might find that you know, you, you end up having to pay lenders mortgage insurance. Also the absolute caps as well, like investment loans are generally capped at 90%. So if you're like literally writing that threshold on 90%, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a, uh, it comes back lower than expected, 
you'll probably find you have issues. And also if you're borrowing right at your limit, like you actually need yeah. a particular loan amount with no buffers, um, you'll find that that's an issue as well. So if you do have, you know, if you can't, if you're flexible with the LVR moving, because if your financial position supports that, then that's always ideal, just reduces the chance of evaluation causing a, a show stopping event. So yeah. that's something I thought I might mention. Yeah, that's good. Um, the other point is to ensure your solicitor reviews the contract and adjusts, you know, key technical items in the contract. Like anything in the contract can be changed. Um, it is really, I, I'm always surprised at how so many buyers without advice will just buy and not have a solicitor review the contract before you sign it. Not during the cooling period because you, you know, you have less leverage then. Anyway. Um, so the other thing to think about is changing some more clauses. So things like use of campaign photos. So using the sales photos um, for advertising and also being able to advertise for a tenant before settlement. With the building and pest inspection, now there is a time frame for when you would do this, but if you get agreement on price, you do your building and pest inspection and you find out that the roof is an absolute mess and you need $10,000 to cover that, then you can go back. It's at that point that you would then negotiate the price down um, and there's a lot of variations along there. Um, the other point that we always negotiate on, negotiate on is early access. So accessing the property prior to settlement, really for the purposes of just measuring up. Uh, my advice is that you don't conduct substantial work until um, after settlement. And then the final key point, um, once again, uh, if you there's a property that you love and they've got this amazing barbecue area out the back, you know, you can negotiate to include extra items um, that would be hard for the vendor to take out and will increase the value of the property. Uh, yeah, alrighty, so that is pretty much us. So thanks very much for watching. You can reach any of us at our main sites. So john at realpropertymanager.com.au, ken at avora.com.au and me at propertyfrontline.com.au. Thanks for watching. Bye.